Hello everyone and uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Mabek and I'm the Data Science Program Chair of Europe AUA. And we have organized the Data Science Summer School uh, Europe two weeks is, uh, and, and we have invited uh, Mian to uh, talk about, uh, to have a course, a crash course on uh, data science in healthcare. And he also kindly um, agreed to have uh, this uh, open talk about how the sense can be used in healthcare. Now, are you please uh, use yourself a little and we can start. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adek. Uh, thank you all for coming here. I'm really honored to see so many people here today. And it's always a pleasure for to be back in Armenia and meet uh, people in the sphere where I work or not. So many of you here I met, uh, some of you I have met previously, but I will briefly introduce myself. So oh, I have yes. graduated here. <laughs> I have graduated here in Yerevan State University. Uh, now I live in Ireland with my wife and three kids in Dublin. I did my PhD here in the National Academy of Sciences. I spent some time in the University of Cambridge in the Center of uh, Medical Applied Statistics. Then I worked as a GIS uh, Management Information System Officer here in Armenia, working with different organizations, mostly funded by the USAID. Then, since 2008, I moved to Ireland, where I was invited initially to work as a postdoctoral researcher, and then I got my Curie Fellowship. I moved to the United States, where I worked in the University of Maryland for a few years, came back to Ireland, and now uh, I work as a data scientist there. Um, about a year ago, I, I started to work in a company called United Health Group, including um, leading the data science team there as a director. So, yeah, you can see the picture of the office <coughs> there, uh, the building where I work. It's very beautiful, having sitting. Uh, this is who am I, and I'm happy to talk about data science and big data applications and emerging technologies in healthcare, particularly in medicine. So, this is an interesting picture, and uh, when we talk about healthcare, we need to realize that actually we are talking about sick care because our systems are set up to treat sick people. They are not well set up to keep us healthy. And very often we end up in the hospitals when the disease is already there. We are waiting just to get diagnosis, and often, unfortunately, it's too late. And we have this continuous data in healthcare. We are having our periodic visits to our physician, we are getting our blood pressure checkups, we are getting some vaccinations or blood tests or some EKG. And these are just this continuous data. We are not getting a constant stream of data real time which could help to get better decision about our health and about, about ourselves. And it is not surprising if you consider the format used currently in many countries and uh, in many hospitals. So there's a huge amount of data stored in paper format currently. Although there are many companies are working to digitize this information, there are many hospitals who are using digital information. And I actually met today Garen, who is working on digitizing information from Armenia, so we are happy to learn about it. But still, there are a lot of hospitals using paper format using fax machines to transfer data, and it's not effective, and it costs us time, it costs us money. And this is a picture from Hungarian hospital where they uh, monitor the patients, they track patients using this manual tracking system, and you can see the patient index card even there. So this is, this is a picture which you would, would expect from 20th century hospital. You wouldn't expect anything to see like this in a modern hospital. And this is something where digital, uh, the digital uh, technologies and big data technologies can help to improve and make more effective and productive. Otherwise, we are spending too much time. We are spending an hour waiting our doctor, and we are getting just about 10 minute, 15 minute visit afterwards. And when we are having the visit, often we don't even remember many details, what was wrong with us a week ago, why we were not happy, what was uh, the specific pain we were feeling in which part. So the doctor is asking a lot of questions, but we are not being able to answer those questions accurately. 
And when you consider how difficult it is for the doctor, this is another issue, right? We have about 15 minutes with doctor, and the doctor needs to understand what's wrong with us. He needs to ask a lot of questions. He needs to do physical examination and understand what's wrong with us. And then he needs to recall the research done in that field. And based on all that knowledge, hopefully he will be able to give us better treatment, correct diagnosis and treatment. And of course, it's not easy considering the amount of information usually needs to do correct accurate diagnosis. And that's why uh, many uh, physicians are under stress, many patients are not happy, and the survey results shows that about 60% of physicians are feeling that they don't have enough time to spend with their patients, and many patients, about 63% of patients, forget to adhere to medications, and there are many people who have chronic disease, so the situation is not good. And this is where electronic health records come to assistance. And electronic health records uh, initially were created as a digital alternative for paper records. So they are digitized versions of this data we are collecting during our medical visits, our hospital admissions, and lab tests, and uh, different lab results. And it collects and stores the patient's health information, basically. There is a huge industry there. So you can see the numbers. In 2016, it was estimated 23 billion value for VHR. And just after a few years, 10 billion is estimated to grow. So there is a huge potential there. And many companies, many countries are actually trying to work in this sector. And it's necessary because there is a new direction for patient care now. Uh, until recently, there was a big disconnection between patient-generated data and hospital-generated data. We know that there are a lot of wearable devices. We all have mobile phones. We have uh, different sensors and uh, mobile devices. And we collect a lot of information about ourselves, our activities, our environment. But unfortunately, this information is not shared with our clinicians, with our health uh, organizations. <coughs> And uh, from the other side, our health organizations are collecting a lot of data. When we are visiting the hospital, we are doing some medical images. So there is a lot of data collected and stored in organizations. And there was no proper connection until recently. But now, with the technological progress, we have this opportunity to synchronize these data sets. We, we can actually share the data with healthcare organizations and get the data back. This will give us better understanding where we are now, and it will help us to be on the same page with our doctors. So there will be not just daily tasks, they will be not used only just for daily tasks, but the doctors will be able to see the real-time data and understand, OK, something is wrong going on with my patient. Maybe I need to call. Maybe I need to uh, have another visit tomorrow instead of waiting a month or identifying the patients who are at risk for some particular uh, disease or so on. So there's a lot of potential there to share this kind of information. And there's a huge uh, amount of information coming from different sources. So in this chart, you can see some of the sources, particularly used in healthcare. And clinical data is only a small portion here, as you can notice. Imaging data used in medicine, like x-rays, MRI, CT scans, is another portion of its data. You can notice that genome is quite a big portion of data, covering a covering big portion of data. There are a lot of other data coming from metabolome, microbiome, device data. Again, we use these wearable devices. We use these activity trackers or mobile devices. So they generate a lot of data we can share with our healthcare organizations. We are exposed to pollution and environmental hazards, so environmental information is also very important for healthcare. And this is also something we need to consider. And finally, social data, our personal circumstances, our uh, geographical location, our neighborhood, these are all affecting on our health. So just considering clinical data is not enough to get to be healthy, basically. We need to use all the information we can. And the uh, relationship between physician and uh, client uh, patient is changing. Nowadays, 
uh, we are more educated, we have access to more data, more research, uh, we understand, so, uh, we do some research ourselves and we want to take part in decision making. We don't want just to accept what was told, we want to take part in this decision. Um, this is changing. And mostly this is changing because of technological advances. We can see that the access to internet worldwide is rising exponentially. So there is a huge amount of people now have access to internet. Quite about, let's say, 10 years ago, the number was much, much less. And it's not just internet. If we consider total population in 2018, 7.5 million, about over half of them already have internet access. About 68% already use mobile phones. And there's a lot of people using social media and other internet activities. So this all help us to generate data and use data to be data users and data providers. And this is mostly driven by Moore's law, which is basically showing that uh, the uh, power, uh, the computer capacity is doubling every other year. And this is phenomenal. <coughs> this, this is why our mobile phones now are like supercomputers of uh, 1980s. They are more powerful than the computers that they are used in NASA when they were landing on the moon. And this is why we can use these mobile devices as a medical device. So we can use them as a mobile medical devices to follow our health. And when we think about our future, we need to start to think exponentially. Otherwise, we are doing bad predictions. If you take a look in this uh, chart, like uh, this uh, current row, and it is growing up to the present days, there are several ways you can do the forecast for the future. You can take into account the trajectory based on the past growth rate, then it will be very bad prediction, we will end up here. We can take another approach, taking trajectory based on the present growth rate instead of past growth rate. It will be a little better, but again, it will be bad prediction. The correct prediction would be if we take into account the uh, uh, exponential growth. And to make this a little bit simple, this is a nice uh, chart I borrowed from Wait by Y website. It shows the surprise factor from exponential growth. Mm -hmm. So very often we think that our life is very predictable, but in fact, if you think exponentially, you, will, you never know after five years what kind of technologies will be here, which we are not even thinking about now. And this is not just one technology. This is a combination of multiple technologies. We, we are seeing advances in all different sectors like <coughs> artificial intelligence, surgical robotics, and remote access. Uh, and so, so many things are developing. And innovation comes when these different technologies are layered together, when they are combined. And we are seeing this kind of innovations. Now we are already used to these digital payment types. We are changing our way of uh, watching movies. We are using uh, different type of electronic books instead of general books. We, we change our uh, behavior when we are booking flights or booking taxi now. And, and this is continuing, this is changing. And this is so-called Amazonification effect is transforming everything. Starting, uh, starting from finances and ending in healthcare industry. And uh, like company like Uber uh, hasn't invented anything new. Uh, they they uh, just combined. They haven't invented online maps. They haven't invented uh, online payment systems or GPS device. They just layered all these technologies together. And after three years, their value of the company grew by 18 billion. And this is, also, uh, this is also driven by demographic shift. Now we have growing number of population, millennial population, millennial generation. And millennials uh, are digital natives. They are growing with these technologies. They are, uh, they are, it's very, very common for them to use brands and to use these mobile technologies. And they want to get this kind of technologies in their life. And when we are asking what is the ideal healthcare experience for these consumers? The convenient access is the biggest one. The survey done in the US showed that 59% wanted to have digital healthcare experience. 
uh, and they wanted to uh, mirror retail actually. People are quite happy about retail experience and they want to move for healthcare to move to that direction. 74% of millennial patients value the ability to book appointment buy and pay online. And 48% want to partner with healthcare provider for personalized treatment. So there is a big shift and this is a very attractive market also. It's not just, uh, uh, it's, it's attractive for all companies both in healthcare and in technology because there's a lot of money. Like the forecast for 2025 healthcare landscape annual revenue is 5.5 trillion US dollar. And this is very attractive. And we have uh, giants both in healthcare and in tech industry. Tech industry have huge experience in technical side, but they don't have much experience in healthcare, so they are trying to shift there from that side. While in healthcare industry we have companies who have great potential and great data sets covering healthcare and medicine, but they don't have enough technical capacity, so they are trying to increase their technical capacity. So everybody is trying to get a piece of this nice 5.5 trillion. And there are a few nice examples, like we all heard about Ivan Watson, which first became famous when it won the game in Geopardy, uh, winning all time two winners, uh, two champions of the game. And another example is AlphaGo from Google. And uh, you may remember the headlines when AlphaGo beats the Go, uh, Go master Lisa Dodd, who was all time best Go player and considered that the computer never would be able to play Go at such level. So both IBM and Google are moving to the healthcare sector also. IBM Watson was used in German hospitals trying to do this. Is uh, diagnosis. They were using a lot of data provided from different sources and then uh, patient information. And the idea was that Watson would give the diagnosis and the diagnosis will be checked by a medical doctor and then it is correctly to be approved. Of course, it was not so simple. Uh, IBM was one of the first in the sector, so it was not totally successful. Uh, many people working in hospital felt that it was failure because Watson wasn't able to you know, diagnose even some simple diagnosis. In case of, uh, for example, simple cases when there was a pain chain, uh, chest chain, or high temperature, instead of giving diagnosis of flu, uh, Watson could go into some rare diseases of cancer, lung cancer, and so on. So it was not very satisfactory. The other application was Google AlphaGo. They are using it currently in the United Kingdom with eye disease treatment. <coughs> and they are training a lot of models using OCT scan of eye, eye uh, images and using AlphaGo for uh, diagnosing eye diseases. However, again, there are some issues there. There's privacy issues. Many people in the UK feel that there was a privacy breach for data. So there are a lot of challenges there for companies. But there is a big investment in big data. So we can see the numbers. In 2018, there were about 4.7 billion estimated value, while in 2021, after a few years, it's already 7 billion. So a lot of investments go there. Um, growth in data is also phenomenal. Like the healthcare data is growing. Hugely, you can see 2013 volume estimated 153 exabytes. In 2020, it is estimated to grow up to 2,314 exabytes. Just to give you a perspective, this is huge amount of data. We may not be even able to store this data. So, if we take a results from Cisco, Cisco Global Cloud Index report. So you can see that by 2020, it is estimated that we will have capacity for 985 exabytes, which is 2.5 times less than just data will be generated by medical devices and in healthcare in general. So there's a huge challenge even to store data. You can imagine how difficult it will be to use this data. We will need a lot of machine learning, artificial intelligence, and computing power to analyze this data to make it useful. And if we adopt these big data technologies, it is estimated that the benefits will be <coughs> So you will see the results here from a report which says that there will be about 20-30% in cost saving. 
there will be about 35% rise in patient access and 20% improvement in outcomes and about 30% growth in revenue. So this is a very attractive field. And what would be the verification of healthcare look like? Same for verification here, this is an example of Uber I wrote. So here is that uh, what we look like uh, healthcare if we combine these different technologies and make them user friendly, make them accessible and make them easy to use. So we will go through some examples of different applications and medical devices just to give you an idea what is already already applied and what is in this uh, actually coming soon. So this is a price uh, cost per genome sequencing. So you can see how much it is uh, reducing the price. So it went down significantly. Already it is a couple of thousand US dollars you can do the genome sequencing. And why this is important? Of course, we don't need our gene to know our genome uh, to realize that we need to have healthy food and we need to exercise. But there are some diseases which uh, we, we need to do genome sequencing to understand if we are prone to have that disease, if we have that gene which may cause the disease in our future. And this become very popular uh, with Angelina Jolie when she announced in 2013 that she carried the gene, uh, cancerous gene, and uh, that gene put her under significant danger of having breast cancer. So she did double mastectomy to reduce her breast cancer risk. And this is called Angelina Jolie effect now. Many women are considering this example and they are thinking to do the same. Some of them are doing. Of course, there are many critics of this approach, saying that, okay, having cancerous gene doesn't matter, it doesn't mean that you are going to have cancer always, so to have such kind of extreme intervention may be not necessary. But again, this is information <coughs> you can have and woman can decide if she wants to do that or not. And it's not just genome or medical data, it's also environmental data. So there is a big effect of environmental pollution on our health. This is the report from UH or World Health Organization. So 23% of all global deaths are linked to our environment. This is roughly 12.6 million deaths a year. And you can imagine how, how big is this because these are lives. And it's, the UN report also shows that particularly air pollution is a big, um, uh, has a big effect on the our health, and there are about 3.7 million deaths attributed to air pollution only. It is well known the effect of air pollution on particular diseases. For example, it is known that asthma, as uh, uh, air pollution is a big trigger of asthma, and many people are suffering from asthma. There are over 230 million people worldwide suffering from asthma. And asthma attack can be vital. People are dying because of it. So having a device having a data which can help to reduce this number is significant. That's why there are some technologies developing. That's why some projects are working on this kind of problems. And I wanted to bring an example in Air Louisville project, which is, a, uh, which is about the small city in Kentucky in the United States, Louisville. Louisville is a tough place to live for people with asthma or any respiratory diseases because the air pollution there is very high. So asthma is a very big problem there. And there is a company there who started to use smart asthma inhalers actually to geolocate, to map the risk areas of asthma and, uh, and see how they can improve the situation. So you can see the map of the all collected data points. So 1.2 billion data points were collected using these smart inhalers. And then another 5.4 million environmental data points were collected from environmental monitoring stations. So this information helped to understand how asthma attacks are related to environmental pollution. It was understood that when air quality gets worse, people are using inhalers more often. And when the temperature is hotter, people are using it often. So this is uh, this sounds uh, this sounds natural and. Uh, but these are the facts. And in addition, they have done the mapping of asthma areas. So you can see the hotspot analysis. They have done the risk map of asthma. 
These are the hotspots where people are suffering and using as my neighbors in the city. And then they have mapped the streets, they have mapped the trees, and they show that, okay, we have big streets, very polluted, and these are dangerous areas <coughs> for these people. And they have green areas, these are nice areas for these people because there are a lot of parks, there are a lot of uh, trees there. So this kind of analysis, this kind of maps are very useful. And they have provided an app which actually could, uh, could do a warning if there's air pollution in a particular part of the city. So people with asthma would know that, okay, I better not go there because it's very polluted now, this time. Not yesterday, not a week ago, but now, it's real time. And this project was quite successful. It was about 82% reduction in asthma, rescue and other use. And rescue is when they have this asthma attack. There was 29% of uncontrolled participants gained control of their asthma. On average, participants more than doubled their symptoms in days. So these are, uh, we are talking about people, we are talking about their quality of life. So this is significant. We all know the damage of physical inactivity. We all know that we need to be active, we need to exercise. But small technologies like wearable devices, like uh, Fitbit device, which I am wearing now also, this gives us some statistics, this gives us some simple uh, numbers about our daily activities. And this motivates us. We are looking at it and we know how many steps I have done today, how many steps I have done yesterday how many I need to do to be healthy, how many hours I have slept. So these kind of simple things can have big influence on our health. This is not a big deal to know how many hours I have slept, but these kind of small devices help me. And there are a lot of similar devices. The devices which you can wear on your clothes, devices you can wear on your <coughs> you can have in your glasses, in your eye lenses. Of course, if you take all the survey results, not everybody are happy to have device in their contact lenses, but 42% would die there on their wrist and so on. So there's a lot of possibility to use these kind of devices. And there are more than 40,000 applications, health-related applications in Google Store or in Apple Store. Of course, most of them are not very useful, but for basic things like tracking our uh, walking distance, tracking our sleep, this kind of apps can be very useful and motivating. And the biggest factor in healthcare is estimated to come from Internet of Things or IoT. So these are the small devices which are connected to Internet and they generate a lot of data. So there is a huge marketing, uh, global uh, marketing is growing hugely here. So you can see the phenomenal growth anticipated from 2017 to 2025, from 120 billion to 530 billion. This is phenomenal. And of course, there's a big potential there, taking into consideration aging population, taking into consideration growing chronic diseases, <coughs> rising healthcare costs. These kind of technologies may help us to reduce health costs, to improve quality of life, and make a better place to live. And another big sector is mobile health. So mobile health technologies is also anticipated to grow significantly from 4 billion in 2016 to 111 billion in 2025. So that's why not surprising there are so many apps now developed in the health sector. So many mobile devices are developed in this sector because there is a huge potential there. And now you can use mobile devices already to do blood pressure monitoring, you can do monitoring your heart rates or performing ultrasound scans or analyzing even urine samples. So this kind of technologies already exist. You can even have smart toothbrush, which will give you an idea about your brushing habits. You can have a, a smart scale, which will tweet about your weight. I'm not sure if it's a good idea, but you can have it. You can have a, device which will show how much you have to drink today and are you allowed to drive. And these are all already existing. And Google has a project called ARA, which is developing a phone which is uh, composed from several different components. And you can have a component which is designed for checking blood sugar for diabetics, for example. You could have some sensors there which is checking air pollution for asthma people, and so on. So there's a lot of potential there. 
And we are getting into our young citizens also. I think you probably don't need a hint to understand what these smart uh, hunters or smart hackers are doing. They are kind of tweeting whenever there is some information coming from our youngsters. So sometimes maybe there is too much information there. And this information can be stored in different places. This information, there are already uh, technologies to store this information in tattoos. So you may get tattoo after uh, after hospital visit, for example, with your information on your tattoo. And there is a big uh, research going on in ingestibles. So wearables are be becoming ingestibles. We are swallowing smart devices. And this is very big. This can replace endoscopy, for example. You can swallow a small camera and you don't need to do endoscopy because smart pills are also very important. Technologies like future mirrors <coughs> may be very interesting. You want to understand what you would look like if you eat something or if you don't eat something. You may want to know how your skin will look if you smoke before smoke or after smoke. You may want to know what your face will look like if you use too much Facebook. So, <laughs> and these digital devices are becoming mobile. Previously, doctors need to, you, you need physically to visit your doctor to get these checkups. And doctor has this equipment in this office or in the hospital. But now there are a lot of mobile devices. You can have a suitcase with a lot of devices and doctor can be, actually can walk to the patient if it is a remote area. Or you can even have the device yourself. You can stick the device into your mobile phone. Like in this picture here, you can do the eye, uh, ear examination. And there's a lot of similar small mobile devices that are not now. Like in this example, you can see these mobile devices measuring uh, blood pressure, temperature, oxygen level, breathing rate, doing AKG. So there's a lot of things going on. So these devices already exist. These uh, devices are providing a lot of data. There are some special devices uh, uh, designed for people with epilepsy. So this device may help to predict when the person may have epilepsy episode, so we can prevent it or at least you can get some assistance. There is this uh, device which uh, helps to do urine analysis at home, so very easy to do the analysis and send it to a doctor, and then if you need, you can go for a treatment or just get the analysis online. This is a device which you can connect to your phone and get your blood pressure checkup, very helpful for people with diabetics. The results can again go to the doctor immediately. And this all brings data, this all composed the big data we are getting out from these all different sectors. And now let's imagine, okay, we are getting a lot of data, we are quite healthy, but again, we need to visit doctors. And this is where telemedicine is coming into play. So online consulting is already very popular in many countries. You can get 24-hour service, you can get service from very remotely, uh, position, physician, very well known physician, uh, physically will be not able to attend. So there is a lot of technologies going into telemedicine. And there is a lot of technologies in artificial intelligence in robotics. And they are uh, used even for uh, predicting mental health outcomes. Like you can see here, the algorithm performs better than doctors at predicting mental health outcomes. I'm not sure if that's true, but at least there is a work going on and in the next two uh, in the next five, ten years we don't know where we'll be with this. 3D printing is another big area. It has a phenomenal growth in recent years. Uh, in 2010, only three hospitals in the US are using 3D printing. In 2016 already 99 hospitals are using 3D printing. And 3D printing is used in different sectors for healthcare. You can use it to print artificial bonds. You can use it to print prosthetics, braces supports, even tiny organs, holy pills. A picture here, these are 3D printed pills 
for patients who need to get multiple drugs so they can combine everything into one small pill. So these are also very popular. And of course you can use 3D printing when you have a fracture, you have broken bone. So you can do your x-ray, you can do your 3D scan of your hand for example, and then you can get customized uh, support for your hand. And a robotic arm, like a nuke arm, is already reality. It is actually, if you take a look at the status, it's commercially available. So we don't need to watch Terminator anymore. We can just go to a nuke arm. And biocredit here, it's under research, under development, but very soon we will have this too. Virtual reality is also a big in this sector. Originally, it was always connected with entertainment but it has a huge applications in healthcare. It is used to train healthcare workers, particularly for specific surgeries, which are very expensive and very difficult. You can use virtual reality to train the surgeons. And you can use virtual reality to treat mental health problems for patients. So there is a phenomenal growth. You can see the growth in 2017. It was 8.9 million, while in 2022, we are expected to have 200. 85 million revenue. And robot-assisted surgery is another big application. There are, uh, there are a lot of advantages of using <coughs> robotic surgery. It is minimally invasive, it is more precise and controlled, and that's why if you take into account, uh, if you take the numbers there, that we, we had 36% before, and there are 65% after learning about the benefits, the applications. And this is becoming something like our cars now. The modern car has over 200 sensors which inform the driver if anything is wrong with the car. We see all these warning lights, engine lights, and we know, okay, we need to take our car to the car. <coughs> Imagine that you are having similar kind of system. You are getting a lot of information from different sensors on your body, on your clothes, on your phone. And this data goes to the cloud. Your doctor may see the data or the artificial intelligence may identify the risks for you and you will get a message back saying, okay, you better not go to the restaurant, the food there is not healthy for you today, or you need to visit your doctor because your heart seems to be strange today. So this is already happening. And we are all used to information sharing when we are dealing with Google Map or air traffic, for example. Mm -hmm. You can see how cars are driving in the streets and we are giving some data and in return, we are getting some information. We are deciding which uh, road to use, where to go, where is not traffic. <laughs> Similar air traffic, you can see how this air traffic data exchange is going on there. And imagine that you can do the same in healthcare. Because we live in social communities, if we share the data, we are making our social community more aware about general environment, about what is happening in social. Of course, there are some privacy issues, but even some uh, anonymized data, you can improve the situation, you can get better educated about your environment and your social network. And if you know your social network, you may decide one day, do you need to shake that hand or not, because they make danger there. And there is a huge advances in technology. Just this uh, graph shows that in 1913, the average uh, life duration was 34 years. Just after about 100 years, it is more than doubled. So there's a huge, huge impact of technology and research for healthcare, and this is continuing. So to summarize, I think we are living in a very interesting era. This is the era where we have all these technologies is emerging, and um, we need to realize that medicine and healthcare is changing from is continuous to continuous, from reactive to proactive. So we are collecting all this data. And very often technology is there before we realize. So we need to use it. We need to apply it. And we need to create our own innovation. Thank you.